Plato's Apology. Um, what's that about? The trial of Socrates. What was the issue? Guilty or not guilty? That's certainly part. What else? I mean, what was the? What was he doing in the apology? Anything? Uh, my memory is so bad <clears throat> that I have to get help. He was defending philosophy. What? What? He was defending philosophy. Defending philosophy? Yes. There's a prejudice against philosophy, right? Yep. Or was it just against Socrates for bugging people? And? Against Socrates and for... And against him personally. Yeah, personally, because and the, some of the... Against... Some of the people... Soc you know, personally. Right. Right. Were, you know, he really pissed them off. Good, good, good. More? The misperception between philosophy and sophistry. Yes. Um, it was a failure. What was it? No. 283 to it. It was two. No, 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 no. The dialogue is a failure. Agree? It's never a failure. Oh, no. No, no. <coughs> well, he says it's a failure because he said he lost. See, if there's a prejudice against philosophy and soccer and against him personally, and he has to defend it, uh, let me tell you, it's a mistake. The dialogue was a mistake. I got, I got an email from a guy who was living at that time in Athens, <coughs> and it was dated, so I know it was genuine. There it is, you know, 400 BC. So it's accurate. And it said, the apology is a failure. So I thought I'd come to you guys and see whether or not that's true, because I need to know that. Who's, a, who's the real well, audience? Is the real audience the reader that Plato imagined? In which case, here we are 2,000 years later still wondering about oh, it. Oh yeah, it's still going on. <laughs> and so it's not a failure. One of the greatest successes in the world. Okay. But if his audience was that... <laughs> Oh, how foolish of me. <laughs> I had the wrong dialogue. Oh. What's the one we're in again? Phaedo. Phaedo. Oh. Phaedo. <laughs> uh, so, what's that about? Is that the dialogue we're in, Jim? The theme? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's what we're in. <coughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I misspelled it. Okay. <coughs> oh, okay, all right. Um, what's that? Okay? Forget this now. Uh, and the Phaedo? The Phaedo is the successful trial of Socrates, not the apology. Anybody bring a book so we can? Yeah, here. Don't. No. no. <coughs> Is that right? Yeah, see? I got a sheet. <laughs> so look. Mm -hmm. 
So what you're saying is that the Phaedo is Socrates being put to the screws because he's got to come up with Cebes and Simeon's, you know, answer to why, you know, dying is not such a bad deal. Well, you see, um, Could you go to page 466, which is 63B? Which of the, which of the complaints are you dealing with right now? Please? I'm going to get there. I'm oh, gonna, you're going to get there? Get okay, there. okay. I just wanted so I could keep track. All good complaints need a warm-up, Barbara. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the prologue. This is the prologue. Any good complaints required. What's the page again? 466. So let's get a reader. Want to read it? Loud. Go. Where do I start? Probably. Which one do you want me to read out of? Um, oh, you have two. Yeah. The, 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 uh, that one, just for the moment. The bottom? Very. Oh, let him, let him oh, I'll, I'll help you out. I'd like to, half and half. I do half, you do half. So I'll play Simeon, you play Socrates. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Very well. I will try to convince you better than I did my judges. I believe, my dear Simeus and Seves, that I shall pass over first of all to other gods, both wise and good, secondly to dead men better than those in this world. And if I did not think so, I should do wrong in not objecting to death. But believing this, be assured that I hope I shall find myself in the company of good men, although I would not maintain it for certain. But that I shall pass over to gods who are very good masters. Be assured that if I would maintain for certain anything else of the kind, I would with certainty maintain this. Then for these reasons, so far from objecting, I have good hopes that something remains for the dead, as had been the belief from time immemorial, and something much better for the good than for the bad. Um. The top line on page 466. Quite right, said he. I think I must answer this before, right, before you, just as if we were in a court. Right? Hey. As if we were in a court. Ah, another trial. Right? What's the difference? You see, in this one, he doesn't explain the practice of philosophy. In the Apology, he doesn't do that. He talks about his role in society in relationship to the gods, but he does not define or explore what he means by philosophy. Would you agree here there's another trial. Right. They're seeing it. He's he's right, he's in court. You see, right? Look here. Very well. I will try to convince you better than I did my judges. Hmm. What's he, what did, what did, kind of language is that? He's going to do better to convince them than he did his other. Therefore, they, they're a jury. There's a jury in the apology. Huh. Well, if that's the case, we have two trials. And would you agree we have the charges here 
and we have the charges here. Remember, how many did you get? There are five or six, are they not? Come on, line them up. I shall pass over first of all to other gods. Right? Big word, other. Wise and good. Ah. I'd like to just go over this last paragraph and, and uh, the reference to the trial. <clears throat> now then, I want to give the proof at once to you as my judges why I think it likely that one who has spent his life in philosophy should be confident when he's going to die and have good hopes that he'll win 
the greatest blessings. Right? In the next world, when he has ended. So Simeus and Sebes, my judges, I was trying to show how this could be true. Right? He's going to try to show how this is true. And here we have two judges and they're going to be judging Socrates. The charges, what he has to demonstrate, is whether or not this is true. Now the group left her last Friday said we totally ignored this, that it's a trial. And there are the judges, Cebes and Simeus. These are the charges he has to demonstrate are true. And the group that met after last Friday were very upset that we just ignored this. Right? So, we don't, want to, we don't want to have another group meeting tomorrow morning. Right, Barbara? Yes, that would be a terrible thing. So this is the real apology. It's a defense of philosophy. This is philosophy. Only instead of its public aspect and theological, right? and how to overcome all of the prejudices against philosophy. This is the exploration of the principal ideas. Six, right? Come on. One. Two. Ah, it should be six. Ah, this one. Between one and two, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. That's the dialogue. Now we should be able to just cut out, right? kind of a cut and paste game. And actually each one of these, see whether or not he's been able to explore this and show what? Not uh, why, that it's true. We want to see on what basis does he make this claim that it's true? So therefore, right, I'm glad you brought your scissors with you. So just cut up your book and stick all the answers along here. And then the part that remains in the text that you haven't cut out is worthless. Wouldn't that be a good test? No? Okay. Okay, next, okay. Would you agree we did some work last time on the idea of death? Philosopher's practice. Now, does he outline seven types of death? Seven types of death? Well, if he does, and they have to be different, of course, and we can arrange them. Watch this now. What keeps Cebes and Simeus from being philosophers? Is it not likely 
that instead of these, they have their own views about death. Is that right? Why would it be interesting if it turns out that there are seven fundamental ideas that Sibius and Simeus have, which so long as they have and hold them, they can't move over here. Can you go to the next step? Did he put his finger on the most fundamental objections to this, this philosophical idea of death, in the way in which he then explores these seven arguments? How does that relate to the myth? The, the myth seven of people. Seven. Seven. Is it Fourteen. possible that it might fit? Yeah. Oh, then these might be Athenians and these are foreigners. Foreigners to Athens, right? Foreigners to philosophy. Oh. Aren't Sibes and Simeus Thebans? Pardon? Aren't they Thebans? Yes. Thebes and Se Semius yeah. are Thebans. Yes, they're Thebans. Yes. Right. Yes. So they're not Athenians. No. It says so in the text. That's right. Well then, does it look like then that this is the way to be a Theseus? Is Socrates a, the a Theseus? Now, but this whole thing, this whole exploration of philosophy, happens to be also in honor of Apollo. Would it not be interesting every time when we go through this text to line up all of the statements that have any reference to Apollo. Uh, there are two other gods that are mentioned too, by the way. Socrates mentions Cadmus and Harmonia because they easily represent the two major arguments that we can find in this list that are very powerful. And therefore, you know what we have here? A contest between different gods. So, um, as I said now, uh, we should now jump into the exploration of the different arguments. Agree? This is where we're going. Now, uh, what if, hey, try this on, what if everyone decides to master any one of these and to be able therefore to take someone else through a dialogue where the other party assumes that position is true and you with the background that you have mastering that particular dialogue should you not then be able to take that person through it using this dialogue as a model that possible? Mm -hmm. So if we had these positions and everyone decided to pick one or two. Now, I know some of you are going to be greedy and want to do it all. Yeah. Right? Like Daniel, he's going to do it all. 
Well, we'll encourage you, won't we? Of course. And you're not going to be upset? Oh, no. If he's going to do all the work? What would follow if come? What would follow if, if you do it? Either any any one part, or some, or all. To be dealing with the principal arguments against philosophy as defined in the Phaedo, and you'd be playing a role which we will call the Theseus role. <coughs> right? Saving the 17. Right? Save them? Ah. Because both of these people haven't finished it, they're, they're, he has to save them by truly dying and save them by putting quiet their fears. They don't discover it is true. They discover their fears are groundless, but they still worry about it in the end. So therefore, what piece are you going to take? From one to seven. Seven. Good, seven. Ooh. <laughs> Harmonia. Pick a number. Now, we should have a prize for someone who can do them all, shouldn't we? What do you think? Sure. Six pack. We'll a six pack, something no noble. <laughs> 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 all right, cold. Let me ask you this. Does this make any difference? What we're putting up here? Yeah. Why? Or what? Well, it's a deeper level of understanding. A different level of understanding? Deep, deeper. That deeper. we should be cautious about going into? or No. Need encouragement? Sometimes. Well, then we'll call on you to encourage everybody to do it. Okay, go. All right? You'd get to go for it. <laughs> Stuff like that? <laughs> okay. All right. Any other comments before we jump in? Well, if it's, a, if it's a true, if it's a true, pardon me. If it's a true trial, it has the evidence has to stand up. Oh yes, it'd be a true trial, wouldn't it? If it, if they're yeah. gonna, if yeah. he's going to put that level of precision on it, as if we were in court, that's right. You got to lay out the evidence precisely. Mm -hmm. Or be doing otherwise, it. Otherwise, it's just yeah, it'd discussion. be in it. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of stuck on other gods. Pardon me? <clears throat> Are you on a particular page? Uh, yes. That I shall pass over first of all to other gods. Other ones. But who are the... Other. Not the other. Who are the ones that, you know... Yes, that are other than... Well, yeah. we know one thing. They're sure as they're going to be different than these two. Oh, well, yeah, I know, but I'm going, I, you know. That's why when you get something like this, quickly get into another translation to make sure that it's there as well. Or the group. Right. Okay. Right, anytime you're working and you find your, your discussion hangs on one word, it's always good to make sure that it's not the function of the translator, but... It's in the text. Well, it looks like it's in it's in that Greek for what that's worth. Mm -hmm. Other God is. Barbara? Other gods. I was just saying it's in the Greek. No. And it's in this translation as well. Okay, good. Other wise and good gods. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we begin, would you agree, therefore, we need to look at the last sentence before Socrates has said he is finished, or the translation, which is at uh, 70. In our <clears throat> when Socrates had thus finished, Cebes took up the word. Socrates, on the whole, I think you speak well. But that about the soul is a thing which is a thing which people 
find very hard to believe. People, right? Not himself, people. That's the way it starts. Let's look at the conclusion of Socrates uh, in the last two sentences in the preceding paragraph. There is my defense before you, gentlemen, on the bench. Simeus and Cebes showing that in leaving you and my masters here, I am reasonable in not fretting or being upset because I believe that I shall find there good masters, good comrades. So, if I am more convincing to you in my defense than I was to the Athenian judges, I'll be satisfied. Would you agree he's picking up all the images from the apology? Therefore, this is what I call, this is the real apology. Right. Or another level of the apology. And at this point, Socrates is finished. Nothing needs to be said other than this. But there is a slight uh, addition that is, that is very worthwhile, which we'll get dealing with the separation of the self and the body. But the practice is all there, not the result. Right? The practice is there, not the result, which means there's no description of what it's like to separate the soul from the body. You have to go where he's making the contrast, and we'll get that over here, when he has to make the comparison. So, would you agree, Socrates, it's finished. The trial is ended. Now, how does Socrates deal with that first argument coming that the many believe in, that our good friend Cebes is introducing? All right, look her. A very curious language. Quite true, said Socrates. Quite true, Cebes. Well, what are we to do? Shall we discuss this very question, whether such a thing is likely or not? Hey, what are we going after? Likelihoods. Let's see if this is likely or not. So what is he going to answer the first one? Likelihood. Let's see if it's likely or not. That's all. Fair enough, so now we can play. Okay, let's go back into it, get a couple of readers, and we pick it up from here. Who do you remember? If we had to pick out some people to be volunteers to do the first argument next week, who would you pick? Whoever volunteered. Oh, you'd go for a volunteer? Hmm. Barring that, Bradley over here was making comments about how he wanted to master. Well, he understood it. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, I heard you talking about them, didn't you? Yeah, you heard Oh. Uh, <laughs> I heard yes. I heard yes, too. Okay, it's done. Okay, thank you for volunteering. The first one? <laughs> yes. Okay, we get a couple of readers up front, and then we stop every once in a while when you raise your hands, just stop the action. Need a couple of readers? Go ahead. All of you. Thank you. One more. What about you? Yeah, yeah, come on up. Me? Yeah. Not supposed to work. Me? <laughs> God, that's against my religion. Am I? Yeah. 
Well, it's only, it only work unless you have to. Oh, all right, okay. We'll play. All right. No more suggestions like that, all right? <laughs> ah. Whenever you're ready. Are we taking it from when Socrates said that's finished? Or you where? pick. Hey, Barbara, could you scooch in just a little bit? What page you got? What page you on, Barbara? Stephanos, please. Uh, 70. 70? CB starts with, uh, for my part, said CB. Okay. For my part, said the CBs, I should very much like to know... I was going to take that part. 473 in the Rouse. And it should be something Because like I can say 70. yes a lot of times. Go ahead, joking. Go ahead. Do it again, please. For my part... I should very much like to know what your opinion it, about it is. See, my translation is different. For my part, said Seabees, I should very much like to know the truth about this matter because I don't want to walk away with shallow and, and false opinions about the things most worthy of knowing. <laughs> we got to get another reader. <laughs> So, it, so see, do we assume that CBS doesn't think there is such a, a thing about as knowing this these matters? Well, I was curious about why does he want to ask Socrates about his opinion? opinion. I agree with you. Yeah. A puzzling dude. That's a mark of one of those people. He doesn't know what knowledge is. Ah, one of the foreigners. Yeah. Especially in this yeah. area. Yeah. Okay. I think. No one who heard us now could say, not even a composer of comedies, that I am babbling nonsense and talking about things I have nothing to do with. So if you like, we must make a full inquiry. Cool. Let That's us inquire <laughs> whether the souls of the dead men really exist in the house of Hades or not? Well, there's a very ancient legend, which we uh, remember, that they're continually arriving there from this world, and further, that they come back here and are born again from the dead. Ah, if that is true, and the living are born again from the dead, must not our souls exist there? For they could not be born again if they did not exist. And this would be sufficient proof that it is true. If it should be readily shown that the living are born from the dead and from nowhere else. But if this is not true, we must take some other line of reasoning. Certainly. Then don't consider it as regards men only. If you wish to understand more easily, I, I think of all animals and vegetables, and in a word, everything that was birthed. Let us see if everything comes into being like that, always opposite from opposite, and from nowhere else. Whenever there, there happens to be a pair of opposites, such as beauty and ugly, just as unjust, and thousands of others like these. So let us inquire whether everything that has an opposite must come from its opposite and from nowhere else. For example, when anything becomes bigger, it must, I suppose, become bigger from being smaller before. Yes. Now, there are two uses in this dialogue of the word opposites. All right? The first is comparative. Right. ER. Bigger, smaller, hot, hotter, colder. ER. All right. Smaller. Greater, all, always be ours.
And if it becomes smaller, it was bigger before and became smaller after that. True. And again, weaker from stronger and slower from quicker. Certainly. Very well. If a thing becomes worse, is it from being better or from just from being more unjust? And more just from more unjust. Yeah, pardon me. If a thing becomes worse, is it from being better and more just from more unjust? I like that. Do it again. If a thing becomes worse, is it from being better and more just from more unjust? Of course. <laughs> I saw that one coming. <laughs> 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 However, since you've been doing all the work, I do not mind doing more okay, of the reading. Okay. Either way. Have we established that sufficiently then, that everything comes into being in this way, opposite from opposite? Uh, yeah, certainly. Again, is there not the same sort of thing in them all, between the two opposites, two becomings, from the first to the second, and back from the second? to the first, between greater and lesser, increase and diminution. And we call one increasing and the other diminishing. Yes. Mm. And being separated and being mingled, growing cold and growing hot, and so with all. Even if we have sometimes no names for them, yet in fact, at least, it must be the same everywhere that they come into being from each other, and that there is a becoming from one to the other. Certainly. Well then, is there something opposite to being alive as sleeping is opposite to being awake? Oh, there is. What? Being dead. Hmm. Well, all these things come into being from each other if they are opposites, and there are two becomings between each two. Oh, of course. Then I will speak of one of the pairs, one of the two pairs that I mentioned just now, and it's becoming. You tell me about the other. My pair is sleeping and being awake, and I say that being awake comes into being from sleeping, and sleeping from being awake, and that their becomings are falling asleep and waking up. Is that satisfactory? Oh, quite so. Then you tell me in the same way about life and death. Do you not say that to be alive is the opposite of to be dead? Oh, I do. And that they come into being from each other? Oh, yes. From the living, then, what comes into being? The dead. And what from the dead? The living, I must admit. Then from the dead, Seabees, come living things and living men? Well, so it appears. Then our souls exist in the house of Hades. Oh, it seems so. Well, of the two becomings between them, one is quite clear, for dying is clear, I suppose. Don't you think so? Well, I'm not sure, Socrates. Could you repeat what you just said? Well, of the two becomings between them, one is quite clear, for dying is clear. Don't you think so? Oh, yes. Then what shall we do? Shall we refuse to grant in return the opposite becoming? And shall nature be lame in this point? Is it not a necessity to grant some becoming opposite to dying? Hmm, surely it is. What is that? Coming to life again. Well, if there is coming to life again, this coming to life would be a being born from the dead into the living? Yeah, certainly. It is agreed between us then. In this way also that the living are born from the dead, no less than the dead from the living. And since this is true, there would seem to be sufficient proof that the souls of the dead must of necessity exist somewhere, whence we assume they are born again. That seems to me, Socrates, from uh, our admissions, that must be of necessity be true. Another way of looking at this, C.B., shows, as I think, that we were right to make okay, these admissions. Okay, let's, let's cool it there, okay? Uh, yeah. 
Um, isn't there somewhere in the text where it talks about if we are a good philosopher, you know, instead of getting stuck, you know, on the wheel, we go up? I'm not sure I understand. Please do it again. Okay. He's talking here about the soul. Right. Continuing to reactivate a human body. No, anything living. Well, anything living. No. Okay. Well, isn't there somewhere in the text that says, if you're a good philosopher, you don't come back. You keep going. The well, soul is still alive, but does it, does it have to die to go ahead if it doesn't come back here? Well, you made your first point, then you added the second part that doesn't fit, does it? Right? Well, because, the guy, no, but I'm yeah, yeah, because Isn't your point that this is interesting, if it's continuous and it turns out that the philosopher may not be reincarnated, then it doesn't fit this model. Correct. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Can we get back to this just one part? Then said Socrates, I will speak of one of the two pairs. Yeah, let's let's go back over that. Um, let's back it up. You want um, me to repeat it, or do you want to read it? The example. Well, then, is there something the opposite of being alive? As sleeping is the opposite to being no, awake. Let's take a look at that. Okay, for a moment. Okay. What do you notice about this curious argument? Basically, this is it, isn't it? There's something, the opposite of being alive as sleeping is to awake. Uh, watch now. He's going to work on this side and apply it to this side. But notice a couple of things about it, shall we? These things come from each other. First claim. And there are two becomings between each two. Because you can fall, this, this would be called what? Sleeping to awake. Waking up. And this would be? Falling asleep. There are two becomings, aren't there? Mm -hmm. The two becomings. Then, said Socrates, I'll speak of one of these, and you do the other. Well, he picks, hey, he picks the easy one. <laughs> and let's him have the difficult one. I would never do that. No. Except those times when I do it. <laughs> okay, we're in this paragraph now, all right? I will speak of one of these two peer pairs that I mentioned just now. And it's becoming. You tell me about the other. My pair is sleeping and being awake. And I say that being awake 
comes from being from sleeping, comes into being from sleeping. Right? Right. Being awake comes from its opposite, sleeping. And sleeping from being awake. And that their becomings are falling asleep and waking up. Uh, is that satisfactory? Oh, yes. Then you tell me in the same way about life and death. Okay? Then. So, he just has to pick up what's ever worked here and put it here, doesn't he? But look here. Um, <clears throat> There's something peculiar about this, uh, and uh, I want to change this from sleeping to uh, being asleep. Well, just being asleep and being awake. Because the activity is between the two. Right? The activity, falling asleep, waking up. These are states. These are processes. Now, just to make it a little more difficult, uh, opposites. Would you agree? Does this mean it admits of qualities, degrees, or not? Yes. Yes. No, I just wondered because um, I was talking to one of the, my colleagues and uh, I pointed out to him that uh, his normal way of appearing, he's half dead. And he took offense at that. <coughs> Can't imagine why. Because. <laughs> well, because he was arguing, no, um, I'm actually 73%. Uh, So he took offense at being yeah. called only 50%. Yeah. yeah, he wanted to be more accurate. Mm. <laughs> see, that admits it degrees, doesn't it? He was dead. Mm. Oh, you mean, oh, I see. No. Mm. Is life a degree? No. no. Is death a degree? No. Why no. are they states? States. states. Mm. They're rather curious. As I said, my Uncle Louie had a group of friends and he used to rank them in terms of, you know, how alive they were. And uh, his wife had a different list of how dead they were. <laughs> you know, it bits of degrees, doesn't it? Or does it? Or does it? Life and death do not. See, but that's what, this is his argument, isn't it? So he moves from ERs to this. Now, um, you say that to be alive is the opposite of to be, see, to be alive, to be, right? States, to be.
and that they come into being from each other. Each comes into being from each other. And if, and if this analogy, come on, if this analogy is sound, if the analogy is sound, then whatever applies here applies there. <clears throat> Agree? Yes. Well, this would be, instead of waking up, Coming to life. Coming to life or to be reincarnated or what? Right? To be born. And going the other way? Dying. Dying. Death. To, to die. To, is, it, is it ING? Is that, pardon me. No. Is this a dying? Not as a process, which admits of degrees. That's the point you just made. Yeah, see, I want to see whether we can apply it most strictly. Mm -hmm. There's something curious going on, but I can't explore it unless we see the curiosity in this construction. Um, if this were the case, all right, then this would be falling, falling asleep, falling into death, right? Mm -hmm. ING, it would be a process, agree? Yeah. And this way also there has to be a process. But at this point, you're wondering about how this construction that he started with fits. Unless you can be deader and aliver. And that's why I was willing to give my story about my family. My Uncle Louis, right? Mm -hmm. he, every person he knew, he could rank them just how much alive they were and how dead they were. Or, it's foolish and you can't do that. I vote for B, it's foolish and you can't do that. Mm. Okay then, look. Shall we refuse to grant and re Okay. Well, of the two becomings between them, one is quite clear, for dying is clear, I suppose you, uh, I suppose, don't you think so? Oh, yeah. Then what shall we do? Shall we refuse to grant and return the opposite becoming? And shall nature be lame in this point? Is it not a necessity to grant some becoming opposite to dying? What's that? Coming to life again. And this coming to life, of course, would be to be born from the dead. And he says, this is sufficient proof, right? For a likelihood. Agree? Picking up the way we started? Mm -hmm. It's a likely right. This is a likely argument. And how does Socrates use this word sufficient? It's not perfect. Right, remember book six in the Republic where Glaucon reports his understanding and Socrates says, well, it's, it's sufficient, right, it's, it's, it's adequate, it's sufficient. Look, the second part, 
Okay, any more? We hold this for a moment and keep going? Because she's going to give the next part. It is agreed between us then, in this way also, that the living are born from the dead no less than the dead from the living. And since this is true, there must, that there would seem to be sufficient proof that the souls of the dead must of necessity exist somewhere. Whence we assume they are born again. It seems to me, Socrates, from our admissions, that must of necessity be true. Another way of looking at this, C.B., shows, as I think, that we were right to make these admissions. If, op if opposites did not return back continually to replace opposites, coming into being just as if going around in a circle, but if birth were something going direct from opposite, once only, into the exact opposite and never bent back and returned back again to its original, be sure that in the end all things would get the same form and go through the same process and the becomings would cease. But, whoa, whoa, how, how do you mean? Well, I mean, well, you know, what I mean is nothing difficult to understand. For example, if there were falling asleep but no waking up, right, but waking up did not return back to, to in its place, coming into being from, right, got it? I'm, I need some, something to drink for a minute, okay. But, uh, could you finish that for me, Barbara? For example, if there were falling asleep but waking up did not return back in its place, coming into being from, from that one more time. For example, if there were falling asleep, but waking up did not return back in its place, coming into being from the sleeping, be sure that in the end Endymion would be nowhere. And this would show his story to be nonsense, because everything else would be in the same state as he, fast asleep. And if everything were combined and nothing <coughs> split up, the result would be the chaos of Anaxagoras, all things together. In the same way, my dear Cebes, if, every, if everything died that had any life, and when it died, the dead things remained in that state and never came to life again, is it not absolutely necessary that in the end all things would be dead and nothing alive? For if the living things came into being from things other than the dead and the living died, all things must be swallowed up in death, and what device could possibly prevent it? <coughs> nothing could possibly prevent it, Socrates. And what you say, I think, perfectly true. Yes, Cebes, I think this is all perfectly true, and we are not deceived in admitting what we did. But in fact, coming to life again is really true, and living persons are born from the dead, and the souls of the dead exist. Uh, another thing. You know that favorite argument of yours, Socrates, right? New argument. Right? Argument of recollection. <clears throat> so this ceases. Right? Therefore, now we have the next one, the argument of recollection. Something that continues to occur to me is that the soul itself never dies because if it did die, it couldn't bring you know the the living body back. So, in essence, looking at the arguments we're looking at here, the one thing that's constant is the soul must be a vivifying force at all times. It can never have, not have that quality. No, that's right. That's right. 
That is, the soul, whether the soul dies or not is the issue. And uh, you're quite right, because we're talking at this point about the body. Right, that's what I'm saying. We're only talking no. about bodily no. states. No, no. true. Yeah. And as long as we're only talking about bodily states, no. the, the soul must remain, you know, vivified. So we need we need a, a couple of more. Let's get a couple of other readers so Barbara and I can take a break. Unless you feel you're up to it. No, no, that's fine. Okay. okay. Okay, come on. You were going to read? No, I thought somebody else. Oh, was. oh, okay. We got one, one reader. Need another one? I would read, but I have a, a version, oh. a different version that we do. Wow. Well, I'll read. Okay. You want to come up? Yeah, I want to just oh. one I'm reading. Oh, you're not. Sit closer to him. Okay. No, don't get by the mic. So. Jeff, just tell me where now I Now, this opening paragraph is great. This is one of my favorite paragraphs. Okay, where am I? A you pick. No, you pick. <clears throat> you start. Would you want to be I or he? I don't mind either way. Will you just start so that I know sure. where to go? <laughs> Another thing, said Seavey's putting in, you know that favorite argument of yours, Socrates, which we so often heard from you, that our learning is simply recollection, that, also, that, learn, that our learning is simply recollection, that also makes it necessary, I suppose, if it is true, that we learn at some former time what we now remember. But this is impossible unless our soul existed somewhere before it was born into, into this human shape. In this way, also, the soul seems to be something immortal. Well, then Simi is put in. But Simi's, what are our proofs of this? Yours. That's mine. Oh. Then Simi is put in. But Sibs, what are the proofs of this? Remind me, for I don't quite remember now. Which is fun, right? Yeah. The, the yeah. doctor of recollection doesn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> There is one very beautiful this is, proof this is great. that people, when asked questions, if they are properly asked, say of themselves everything correctly, yet if there were not knowledge in them and right reason, they would not be able to do this. You see, if you show someone a diagram or anything like that, he proves most clearly that this is true. Oh, right? That's the whole position. And now he's going to vary it when he explores it. So who's going to be Socrates? If I'm Simeus. No, it's Socrates said. Sure, I'll do that then. Well, if you don't believe this, Simeus, look at it in another way and see whether you agree. You disbelieve, I take it, how what is called learning can be recollection? Disbelieve you? Not I. I just want to have an experience of what we are now discussing, recollection. I almost remember and believe already from what Siebes tried to say, yet nonetheless I should like to hear how you were going to put it. What do you make of that paragraph? Hmm. What kind of a person is he so far? Come on, some is. <clears throat> Disbelieve you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not I. I just want to have an experience of what you are now discussing. You Recollection. Proof. I almost remember and believe already from what CB's tried to say. Yet nonetheless, I would uh, like to hear how you were going to put it. He's after an experience. An experience. Yeah. I can't disbelieve you. 
I just want to have an experience of what you're now discussing. Recollection. Go ahead. This is how we agree, I suppose, that if anyone remembers something, he must have known it before at some time. Certainly. Then do we agree on this also, that when knowledge comes to him in such a way, it is recollection? What I mean is something like this. If a man has seen or heard something, or perceived it by some other sense, and he not only knows that, but thinks of something else, of which the knowledge is not the same but different, is it not right for us to say he remembered that which he, that which he thought of? How do you mean? Here's an example. Knowledge of a man and knowledge of a liar are different. Of course. Well, you know about the lovers, that when they see a liar, or a dress, or anything else which their beloved uses, this is what happens to them. They know the liar, and they conceive in the mind the figure of the boy whose liar it is. Now this is recollection. Just as one sees Simeus, and often remembers Cebes, and there would be thousands of things like that. Thousands indeed. Then it is that sort of thing, a kind of recollection, especially when one feels about things which one had forgotten because of time and neglect. Certainly. Very well, then. When you see a horse in a picture, or a liar in a picture, it is possible to remember a man, and when you see Simeus in a picture, to remember Cebes. Yes, indeed. Or when you see Simeus in a picture, to remember Simeus himself? Oh, yes. These being either like or unlike? Yes. It makes no difference whether seeing one thing from sight of this you think, or of another thing, whether like or unlike, it is necessary. That that, that was recollection. Certainly. Does it not follow from all this that recollection is both from like and from unlike things? It does. But when a man remembers something from like things, must this not necessarily occur to him also, to reflect whether anything is lacking or not from the likeness of what he remembers? He must. Consider then if this is true. We say, I suppose, there is such a thing as the equal. Not a stick equal to a stick, or a stone to a stone, or anything like that, but something independent, which is alongside all of them. The equal itself, equality, yes or no? Yes, indeed. Upon my word, no doubt about it. And do we understand what that is? Certainly. Where did we get the knowledge of it? Was it not from such examples as we gave just now, by seeing equal sticks or stones and so forth, from these we conceive that which was something distinct from them? Don't you think it is distinct? Look at it this way also. Do not the same stones or sticks, oops, how did we switch? Appear equal to one person and unequal to another? Did I skip something? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> do you want to do it over? Sure. Certainly. Where do we get knowledge of it? Was it not from such examples as we gave just now, by seeing equal sticks or stones and so forth? From these we conceived that, which was something distinct from them. Don't you think, don't you think it is, a, is distinct? Look at it this way also. Do not the same stones or sticks appear equal to one person and unequal to another? Certainly. Well, did the really equals ever seem unequal to you? I mean, did equality ever seem to be inequality? Never, Socrates. Then those equal things are not the same as the equal itself? Not at all, I think, Socrates. Yet from these equals, being distinct from that equal, you nevertheless conceive and receive knowledge of that equal. Very true. Well, how do we feel about the sticks as compared with the real equals we spoke of just now? 
do the equal sticks seem to us to be as equal as equality itself? Or do they fall somewhat short of the essential nature of equality, or nothing short? They fall short a great deal. Then we agreed on this. When one sees a thing and thinks, this which I now see wants to be like something else, like one of the things that are, but falls short and is, unab and is unable to be such as that, as that is, it is inferior. It is necessary, I suppose, that he who thinks thus has previous knowledge of that which he thinks it resembles but falls short of. That is necessary. Very well. Do we feel like that or not about equal things and the equal? Assuredly we do. It is necessary, then, that we knew the equal before that time when, first seeing the equal things, we thought that all these aim at being such as the equal, but fall short. That is true. Well, we go on to agree here also. We did not, and we could not, get a notion of the equal by any other means than by seeing or grasping, or perceiving, by some other sense. I say the same of equal and all the rest. And they are the same, Socrates, for what the argument wants to prove. Look here, then. It is from the senses that we must get the notion that all these things of sense aim at that which is the equal and fall short of it, or how do we say? Yes. Then before we began to see and hear and use our other senses, we must have gotten somewhere knowledge of what, of what the equal is. If we are going to compare it with the things if we were going to compare it with the things judged equal by the senses and see that all things are eager to be such as that equal is, but are inferior to it. This is necessary from what we agreed, Socrates. Well, as soon as we were born, we saw and heard and had our other senses? Certainly. Then we say we must have got knowledge of the equal before that. Yes. Before we were born, then? It, it is necessary that we must have got it? So it seems. Then, if we got it before we were born, and we were born having it, we knew before we were born, and as soon as we were born, not only the equal, and the greater, and the less, but all the rest of such things. For our argument now is no more about the equal than about the beautiful itself, and the good itself, and the just, and the pious, and I mean everything which we seal with the names of that which is. The essence, when we ask our question and respond with our answers in, our, in discussion, so we must have got the proper knowledge of each of these before we were born. That is true. And if having got the knowledge in each case, we have not forgotten, we must continue knowing this and know it through life. For to know this, having got knowledge of something, and to keep it, and not lose it, dropping knowledge, Simeus, is what we call forgetfulness, isn't it? Just so, Socrates. But I think if we got it before birth, and lost it at birth, and afterwards, using our senses about these things, we recover the knowledge which once before we had. Would not what we call learning to be to recover our own knowledge, and this we should rightly call recollection? Certainly. For you see, it has been shown to be a possible, for you see, it has been shown to be possible that a man perceiving something, by sight or hearing, or some other sense, thinks from this perception of some other thing which he has forgotten, to which he compares this as being like or unlike, so, as I say, there is a choice of two things. Either we were all born knowing them, and we all know them throughout life, or, afterwards, those who we say learn just rem or afterwards, those who we say just learn remember, or afterwards, those who we say learn just remember, and nothing more. And learning would be recollection. That is certainly true, Socrates.
Which do you choose then, Simeus? Were we born knowing, or do we remember afterward what we had got knowledge of before? I can't choose all at once, Socrates. Another question then you can choose and have some opinion about this. When a man knows anything, could he give an account of what he knows or not? He must be able to do that, Socrates. Do you think that all could give account of the matters we have been discussing? I would that I would that they could. But so far from that, I fear that tomorrow at this time, there may be no one left in the world able to do that properly. Then, Simeus, don't you think they'd all know them? Oh, no. Then are they trying to remember what they once learned? It must be so. When did our souls get the knowledge of these things? For sure. Oh, for surely it is not since we became human beings. Certainly not. Then before? Yes. So, Simeus, our souls existed long ago, before they were in human shape, apart from bodies, and they had wisdom. Unless, indeed, we get all these knowledges at birth, Socrates. Whoops, that's you. Oh, unless, indeed, we get all these knowledges at birth, Socrates, for this time is still left. Very well, my comrade. At what other time do we lose them? For we are not born having them, as admitted just now. Do we lose them at the same, at the very same time as we get them? Can you suggest another time? Oh no, Socrates, I did not see I was talking nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the case then, Simeus? If all these exist, which we were always harping on, the beautiful and the good and every such essence. And if we refer to these essences, all the things which our senses perceive, finding out that the essences existed before and are ours now, and compare our sensations with them, it necessarily follows that just as these exist, so our soul must have existed before our birth. But if they do not exist, this argument will be worthless. If this is true, and there is equal, and there is, if this is true, and there, and is there equal necessity for these things, that these things exist, and our souls did before birth, or if they do not exist, neither did our souls. I am quite convinced, Socrates, that there is the same necessity. Our argument has found an excellent refuge when it maintains equally that our soul exists before we are born, and the essence is likewise which you speak of. Nothing is clearer to me than this, that all such things exist most assuredly, beauty and good and the others which you named, and I think it has been sufficiently proved. Okay, that's it. Thank you much, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> This is a, an argument that uh, is very difficult to maintain. Right? People have all kinds of difficulty maintaining it. Right? And yet, uh, look what he's doing. He's saying, uh, from experience alone, how can you derive Right? This is basically from experience alone. How, how can you derive an idea like equal or equality if you have never experienced it? That's it.
No, I think of, of all the arguments I know of, this is, this is the one that creates the biggest difficulty. Because in modern, what we've been taught, <coughs> or what many people will come to, is that they introduce a new word, right, called we abstract, right? These are series of abstractions. That you can, e you can easily go from one to the other. It happens all the time. Now, is that an objection to this? They would say, on this basis, if you're going to make the argument that your soul existed prior to your birth, it's not going to do it. Same thing. From experience alone, how can you derive an idea like beauty or the beautiful if you've never experienced it? Because all you experience is particular things that are beautiful. That's the same, same argument. And they want to say... And would, yes? No, I was just asking. I th you made the point that and so they they say we abstract the idea from it. Yes. Yeah. It's like the, the argument is. is um, well, everyday things. Everyday things. Well, let, let me do, make it uh, say the step. Um, each tree is different. You never experience tree. What these people, what, what we've been taught is, each of these is a living thing. Ah, what's common to it uh, is that it is a living thing in the uh, plant kingdom. Oh, so next to it you can compare it with things that are living, moving. Oh, then you can go from plant to animal kingdom. And then you can say from there, you can talk about <coughs> uh, that they are, uh, each of these is a living, living thing. Right? So therefore from that, you can go a step further and say you're seeing life. The point being is, as you move from these particular things, these are the things that have intensity, right? You're saying immediacy. You're saying immediacy. These things, therefore, uh, come in contact immediately with you. As you proceed up, you lose more and more of this until you're finally left with a pure abstractions. The words really should be subtraction. The higher you go up, the more you're dropping away until in the end you just have these things. And from life you can say, uh, things itself, just things. And the higher you go up, 
the less vitality, the less reality it has. That's the process of abstraction. Oh, it's like Uncle Louie's list, they're dead. Pardon me? It's like Uncle Louie's list, how dead are they? Yeah, yeah, well. So look, it's the same thing here. These two sticks look equal. Where do you get the idea of equal? That's not in your experience. You, okay, go ahead. You, what do you do? You rub the two sticks together. <laughs> well, if it is the idea that you, in your experience, you'd have a lot of sets of things that are equal-ish, and you somehow let the differences drop away. That's right. You let the differences purify. drop away, and you grab on to the thing you're looking for, and therefore you can say, equal. And someone can come up and say, excuse me, do you want to be more precise if we measure it even more closely? Unequal. Uh, but wait a minute, where did you get unequal? They're opposites. Oh, neither opposites as in the experience. And where do you get opposites? So now he goes, all right, if it didn't, if you can't justify its existence from sense experience, then you must make some kind of a trip into the mind, and it, therefore you never got it through experience. If you didn't get it through experience, you must have gotten it somewhere else. Uh oh. That's uh, too difficult from, for uh, all the arguments. So, well, therefore, the best thing to do is to take a better look at it next time we come back. Right. Hold it. Um, kind of related, a little different. Yeah. The word experience is used twice there. From experience alone, how can you derive the ideas? Yeah. Okay, I got that. But I don't get that it necessarily follows that our soul had an experience. It That's seemed, right. It doesn't seem like we could get it from experience, whether no matter how many lives we have, we still have the same problem when we see a bunch of stuff that's beauty-ish. How do we get to beauty if we our souls aren't of the nature of beauty? In other words, we didn't have the experience of beauty. Our soul, in some sense, at some level, must be beauty. We're recalling ourselves. And he's going to say, finish it, that that is perceived or experienced when you're dead, in the realm of the dead, without sense experience, and you're no longer carrying sense experience. Because you're using experience you just in a keep, different... You just keep the ideas. Yeah. So you're using experience in a different range. Right. In that second right. sense. No. Okay. It's a tough argument. We take a look at next trip. Right? Who's going to master this one? This is a very difficult one. Simple, isn't it? But, but you know, the steps are curious, right? Little bitty steps, and you wonder whether you're bringing and carrying a bigger load than you should. Okay.